We're finally applying our in-depth CPU cooler testing methodology to lower end coolers. You may have seen recently when we did the Igor cooler review and we looked at some of the AMD stock coolers. And now we're looking at maybe a more traditional form of CPU cooler, which is a single tower, 120 millimeter fan supported. It's about $30, so it's in that classic tier of CPU cooler category along with the Hyper 212, and we'll look at that soon as well. And this one is called the Vetru V5. It's gotten a lot of coverage in the last probably eight months or so at this point. We've had this since February, actually, and now it's finally time to go through the review, look at thermals, we'll look at the pressure map and everything else and talk about if this $30 solution is worth upgrading to from something like a stock cooler. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's new keyboards. EVGA's new Z20 and Z15 RGB optical mechanical gaming keyboards have abundant RGB LEDs and programmable macro keys on the left side of the keyboard. They also have a sensor to detect and turn on the LEDs when you're in front of the keyboard and turn them off when distant offering a unique feature for keywords. The keyboard claims a 0.5 millisecond response time and 100 million keystroke lifespan. Learn more at the link in the description below. So we'll start with the key points of comparison on this. The Vetru cooler probably is the most likely purchasing consideration for you if you already have something like an AMD or an Intel stock cooler and your alternatives you'd be considering might be at the lower end, something like a Hyper 212, and at the higher end, maybe you'd be maxing out at, let's say, about $50 for something within still kind of striking distance of this one, and that would be roughly around where the Noctua NHU-12S Redux is that we recently reviewed, or maybe something like the Scythe Fuma 2, which is much larger and also about $50, comes with two fans, and is one that we've given our recommendation for a higher end air cooler that isn't all the way into sort of Assassin 3 or $100 territory. So that'd be the closest comparisons. Those are the ones we're going to make to this stock coolers and then up to about a $50 range for the most uh, apt comparisons. Now we did want to immediately sort of set the expectations for this. This will not outperform a 240 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler. That's not going to happen. The only reason that would happen is if it is uh, the liquid cooler is exceptionally bad, and we haven't tested any recently with this set of data. We have tested some, but not recently with this set of data. Or uh, if it's been mounted poorly, or there's something screwy going on with the unit or the testing configuration or something like that. So just to set expectations, don't expect a 120 millimeter tower, which is just lower surface area before we even look at the liquid, to outperform a liquid cooler. And we'll talk about that today too, because we have some like for like testing there. Now, Vetru claims a 150 watt heat load support for this. How companies measure watts for cooling potential is a little bit weird. They all do screwy things to make their number higher than the others. They're not directly comparable, but we're going to be testing on everything from an R5 class CPU up to an R9 class CPU. So that will be about 68 watts and then about 123 watts and then about 200 watts with an overclocked CPU. That'll give you a realistic look at sort of where you can expect this to top out. Now, if you're wondering how or why cooler and CPU companies can even do screwy things with watts, since it's just a unit of measurement, it should be pretty straightforward to the amount of power one would assume that the CPU is consuming. Uh, the way it actually works is Intel and AMD have their own formulas. They're not the same. AMD's formula was reverse engineered to produce a result which was roughly equivalent to Intel's for marketing reasons, mostly to do with OEMs and SIs. That was back when AMD was trying to get back into the market with Ryzen. We have a whole separate video on it. Power never appears in that formula. And then what companies like well, what some of the cooler companies do is typically they'll use a dummy heater heat load, which we think is the adequate way to do this. They'll push a certain amount of power into the dummy heater, and then whatever the cooler is able to keep within control, that's the rating they'll apply to it. So if their target is, let's say, 50 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Celsius for an analog to some type of CPU, uh, and the cooler is at 70 at 150 watts, maybe they'll say, okay, this is 150 watts. But We'll look at it realistically for you. Okay, there are two versions of this. There's white and black. When we checked, at least before filming, they were both $30 at the time of filming. It has an ARGB 120 millimeter fan that's got two connectors on it. One is a four pin PWM, and the other one is your standard ARGB header. Vetru on its marketing page claims, quote, direct touching copper base is adopted to fit <laughs> the CPU. Sorry to tell you, copper base, you're adopted. Uh, I think they mean adapted there. So it's not copper. The, the heat pipes are copper. They're standard heat pipes. They're six millimeters. There's five of them. 
That's where V5 comes from in this name. Uh, but the base plate or the cold plate itself is actually aluminum. It's very obvious. It's not nickel plated copper. That's aluminum. Uh, and that sits between the copper heat pipes. And of that, let's get into the mechanics, the installation, and then we'll go through the pressure map, the thermal testing and everything else to talk about if this thing's any good, including acoustic testing. The aluminum is clearly the weak point here in contact, but as we'll see in testing, there's enough copper to cope with lower heat loads. There's a small aluminum fin stack on top of the cold plate. This is somewhat standard. We see this on a lot of the small tower coolers. It's always tough to know how much this really does. You would need to test it in a pure lab or R&D environment because in real world use, it's just difficult to get that level of precision down to these small fins, but it's some extra surface area, so that's not gonna hurt. It just might not help much. Thus far, all this is pretty standard for a single tower cooler. The cold plate is about 38 by 44 millimeters. The tower itself is 49 millimeters deep front to back and about 125 millimeters wide, depending on how you count the embellishments at the top end. The fin stack is 113 millimeters in total height from first fin to last, with 85 millimeters of that being full width, while the rest is cut short for apparently ram clearance. This ram clearance is utterly pointless though, because ram isn't there. That's not where it goes. It's on the other side, the fan side of the cooler. So this makes for some really bizarrely short-sighted product development or marketing. We're not really sure who, which department is at fault here, uh, but that's not where RAM goes. So it's not for RAM clearance, although that is originally what the marketing said when we bought it in February. Time to get into the installation procedure. There's actually some really weird stuff in the installation manual here as well. We'll get to that. There's just general inconsistencies with the product that make us concerned more about the attention to detail than the performance. Vetcher used five plastic bags for the hardware, so we would like to see a solution where there's less needless waste, but uh, it was at least arranged and at least all of the hardware was accounted for and included. That's better than we've seen from some other coolers. Vetcher's documentation includes images which are just completely wrong. They're not helpful. The socket orientation is backwards, and Vetcher, for some reason, thinks that AM4 is situated long ways. The only board we know of where this is true is the X570 Dark. Maybe there's another one or two out there. But even then, the RAM, at least with the Dark, moves to the other side. And so the RAM clearance, as they call it, becomes, again, unnecessary. Basically, the documentation presents an orientation for AM4, which is physically impossible in the overwhelming majority of motherboards. Moving on. Two brackets get mounted to the bottom of the cold plate support, each containing two spring tension screws for four total. From here on AMD, the stock AMD backplate is used and four screws are tightened into the backplate. This is pretty straightforward, standard, and very easily done. On Intel, a different set of brackets is used and a somewhat standard plastic backplate is installed under the motherboard. The cooler should be installed with the fan oriented toward the RAM once again, and the four screws socket into the backplate once again. It's just a different one. This is a scenario where a more robust mounting mechanism like Noctua's would be better overall. Typically, a second set of brackets and standoffs are used to more evenly distribute the load across the socket and reduce pinpointed load on the motherboard or the PCB itself, particularly where the screws thread into the backplate. And you'll see more of this in the pressure map. With this setup, there's a lot of force being applied to very specific spots on the board and not necessarily pressure being distributed centrally where you want it. The pressure map helps to illustrate how well the mounting hardware works. This is not a flatness map. This, people get this wrong a lot. It is not how flat the IHS or the cold plate is. It's the pressure distribution. So uh, this measures how much pressure is applied across the IHS and in which spot the CPU used is irrelevant beyond its IHS, so it is not on during the test. The 3950X we test with showed low mounting pressure centrally with pressure only visible towards the edges of the IHS. The cooler is still making contact, but the pressure is low enough that it's leaving performance on the table. You can see the outline of the heat pipes beginning to appear, but it's more obvious in our 3800X map. The 3800X clearly shows each heat pipe making contact. That's much better pressure, but as indicated by the blue coloring, it's still at the lowest end of the sensitivity for each heat pipe. At least the heat pipes are where we see more pressure though, because that's the important part. That's where they're the most conductive and effective, but it's still relatively low overall and uneven. Now we get into the flatness. Surface flatness is pretty standard. 
The Vetri V5 fits the profile of most other air coolers we've tested thus far. What we're looking for is low variance point to point at a micron level, and what we're getting is mostly that. It's not as consistent as maybe the Assassin 3, which did have some spikes in the outliers, but was overall very consistent point to point, but it is overall fine. This tells us that the plate is actually pretty flat, but the poor pressure we saw was from the mounting hardware, not the flatness of the cold plate. That means that lapping the cold plate won't really help the pressure map much. It might even make it worse. But the pressure itself in that map is derived from the mounting hardware used. The plate is fine here, uh, so that's actually better than we might expect for a $30 cooler. And mounting hardware could be improved by adding, again, a second set of brackets with four more standoffs. That would even it out pretty well. We'll start with our noise normalized testing on a ridiculous heat load. This is 200 watts. It is not rated for this but there's a reason we're doing it. We'll revisit this later with lighter 125 watt and 65 or so watt heat loads, and that would be more reasonable for a small tower cooler. We had some viewers in the comments previously asking us to test the Vetri coolers, uh, asking us if they are better than the 240 millimeter liquid coolers on the market, so we wanted to start here. To be clear, before we show this chart, this is, again, not where you should expect the Vetru to do well. It will not do well. That's okay. It's just we're trying to check the expectations. So here's the chart. It failed. The Vetru V5 ends up with an expected did not finish for this. That's not an embarrassing defeat, seeing as it's a single tower cooler and relatively low powered and priced. But again, it's not magic that can outdo a larger liquid cooler. The CPU ended up throttling so hard that we abandoned this test early so as not to produce unnecessary thermal strain on our test bench hardware. The Vetru is not only worse than everything else on the chart, it's also completely incapable of cooling this heat load to begin with. For reference, a good 240mm liquid cooler like maybe the Lian Li Galahad 240 runs at about 58 degrees over ambient. A weaker one, like the Fractal Celsius S24, is still far outperforming the Vetru, which would be upwards of the 80s over ambient. Uh, at 21C ambient or so, and it, that was at 58 degrees for the Celsius, so big difference there. That shouldn't really be surprising. As long as there's a good mount with the liquid cooler, there's nothing logical to suggest that a small tower with one fan would do better than a comparatively large radiator with two fans. A more reasonable comparison would be the air coolers, but even the weaker Ninja 5 at 30 dBA was still running sustainably for the most part, although borderline at 65 over ambient. As for the fractal Celsius, we noticed that it's easy to get a poor mount on the Celsius S24. This is a problem with fractal. Uh, it would result in poor thermals and potentially worse testing results than everything else if that poor mount is used when this cooler is installed. As long as you pay extremely careful attention when mounting the Celsius and you do a quick validation test afterwards, it'll be fine but you may need to do that validation run after installing it to make sure the temperatures look like they should. The Vetra was able to complete the 200 watt test at 100% fan speed and under this initial 200 watt load. At 100% speed, the coolers are allowed to run at an uncontrolled noise level, so we're no longer in a pure like for like scenario, but it's still a very common use case for end users. The noise level is indicated next to each cooler if you're curious where it is. In this test, the Vetra V5 gets the illustrious rank of last place, not many can hold this rank. In fact, some say that only one can be in last place. The Vetru, even at 43 dBA, manages to run three degrees warmer than the Ninja 5 at 30 dBA. That's very inefficient for the Vetru, but it's much smaller than the Ninja. To the human ear, it'd be perceived as multiple times louder than the Ninja 5. We're talking perceptive noise, not acoustic power and yet it's thermally inferior. The 240 mil fractal cooler is the weakest of the liquid coolers we've put on this chart. That holds a 16 degree advantage over the Vetru V5. The EKAO is 18 degrees ahead at 46.6 dBA and thus is more efficient even than the Celsius Prisma. And now it's probably time to look at some smaller air coolers in comparison at lower heat loads. Expectations addressed. Let's move on to the 65 watt heat load on an AMD R5 CPU. This would be similar for hierarchy on something like a 5600X or maybe an i5 CPU. Noise normalized, the Vetru is now more within its weight class. It does well here, actually, competing head-to-head -head with the much more expensive Noctua NHU-12S Redux. The Redux technically holds a lead of a couple degrees, but at $50, it's not the performance that you're paying for anymore. Any argument favoring a purchase of this Noctua cooler in this scenario would primarily be supported by Noctua's reputation. That would mean things like upgrade brackets or general RMA processes, not the thermal performance. You're paying for a known brand that has a certain reputation, uh, but if you just want cheap performance, the Vetru makes far more sense than the NHU 12S, 
It's much cheaper, you save a lot of money. Not everyone can justify 50 bucks on a cooler alone, and even at that $50 range, the Scythe Fuma 2 should probably be considered instead. That's on the other charts, though. We haven't retested it in this one yet. Versus the Wraith Prism, the Vetru improves by a significant 7 to 8 degrees Celsius at the same noise level, and over the Spire, it's about 11 degrees ahead, and not bad for 30 bucks. We also collected VRM thermals. As a reminder, in all these test conditions, the VRM has no issue at all. We're using a high-end motherboard with a good VRM, and it's rated for more than 65 watts that the CPU would push into it here. This still gives us an idea for scale and the impact of particular designs on VRM thermals. So it would be useful to know for lower end boards or higher heat loads. The Vetri V5 wasn't much different than the NHU 12S or the stock AMD coolers. It's fine here. Nothing is horribly out of place. It's about what we would expect for a cooler with a fan on the front where you get some air spray out the sides, but that's about it. So. Really, it's fine is all we're after when we're spending $30 on a tower cooler. Here's the 100% fan speed chart where the Vetru ends up at 43 dBA. That's louder than the Noctua NHU-12S Redux, which manages to maintain a 1.4 degree advantage, and so Noctua's cooler ends up more efficient, but only barely. And the cost is still hard to justify for some price classes of build. The Scythe Fuma 2 blows it out of the water, though. The Fuma 2 is running at a staggeringly low, comparatively, 34.4 dBA, it's approaching a 10x perceived noise difference to the human ear versus the Vetru. And again, that's not acoustic power. That's perceived to the human ear noise difference. Uh, it's also a few degrees cooler, the Fuma 2 that is, so that is further useful here. It's more efficient than the Noctua NHU-12S as well. Even still, just for thermal performance, Vetru is holding its own very well and is a strong competitor for its price class thus far. We have other $30 coolers we need to test. Maybe it'll fall there but so far it's doing well compared to some of the $50 coolers. We wouldn't begrudge you buying this one. The Vetri seems fine for an R5 or i5 style CPU. The Vetri scales worse as heat ramps. The 123 watt heat load is comparable to a 5800X, 3800X, 3900X stock, or really any Intel i7 SKU CPU recently, uh, or a K SKU like 10900 or 11700K. This is a common heat load for a stock CPU to use. And to be clear with those Intel ones, it would be after tau expiry, not during tau boosting. The Vetri V5 falls to the bottom of this chart, as does the NHE-12S. The Vetri is bordering on unusable in our particular test configuration, although it'd be acceptable for auto use with some similar CPUs, provided the case has sufficient airflow. You just won't get the full PB2 or TBB range out of those higher-end CPUs with this cooler. The Scythe cooler, the Fuma 2, demonstrates its efficiency with a 55-degree result, and that's while being slightly quieter than the rest. For a cooler that claims 150 watt cooling capacity though, the Vetru is cutting it awfully close to acceptable here. We don't agree with Vetru's claim, and we really wouldn't recommend using this on 150 watt heat loads in general. Finally, 100% fan speed is more survivable. The cooler can handle it. It's just that the poorly ventilated cases on the market would struggle, and there's not much overclocking headroom, if any at all. The cooler is still at the bottom of the chart. However, it passes the test and it's cheap. So while it's not our first choice, we can completely understand and feel comfortable with this cooler for certain heat loads like this one in a cheaper price class. So closing out then, we now have enough data to come to a conclusion on the Vetri V5. For $30, it is certainly better than the same priced Iguo Shadow Max cooler that we reviewed recently. It doesn't look as weird. So the Shadow Max cooler still has that buy this if you want something weird looking in your computer that can kind of run certain heat loads award, which this one does not take from it. But the Vetri V5 is more standard. It runs cooler uh, in all of our tested scenarios. It is quieter at a given temperature. Uh, and so it, it makes more sense to buy at the same price point if you're after only performance for $30. Whereas the Shadow Max makes sense if you want something for maybe a kiosk PC, something you're putting to sort of show off that's not going to be a very high heat load. So. Versus the Noctua NHU-12S, the NHU-12S is clearly the incumbent. Uh, Noctua has an excellent reputation. It is regarded as an engineering-first company. This is a hard company to go up against and fight in CPU coolers because they've built their reputation on a lot of trust and a lot of engineering. So what Vetru is doing is competing fiercely in thermals, and it does well thermally versus Noctua. Uh, it, is roughly in the same position for heat loads that are appropriate for both coolers. It's not built as well, but it, and some of that comes down to materials choices like copper. Uh, there's more of it to be used in the Noctua cooler, but ultimately they're, they're cooling about the same in our testing. 
the places that there are downsides, Noctua has benefits outside of these charts, and that gets difficult to weigh. One of them is Noctua's recently reproven history of providing free upgrade kits for new sockets. This means that their coolers will likely continue to be supported going forward as sockets and mounting mechanisms change. This means less waste, both financially for you and materially for the planet. That's a good thing. We don't know whether Vetri will do this. It doesn't cost much for a company to do upgrade kits. And even if Vetri sells it for a few bucks, like Noctua does, if you can't prove purchase, it's about $8, then that's good enough. The question is whether they'll bother at all or if they'll just ship a new cooler altogether once the sockets completely change. So we're not sure how Vetri will handle that going forward. Uh, this cooler is new to us and we haven't worked with the company before. We can't really speak to how Vetri plans to maintain its products. For what we've seen so far, we saw some criticism in Amazon user reviews of Vetri's customer service, and we saw uh, concerns of DOA fans. Ours was not DOA. That's a sample size of one. We can't speak to everyone's. Um, there's always going to be a DOA product somewhere in the user reviews, but it's a question of how well they replace it. And at this point, we can't speak to that, and uh, ours arrives working. So something to maybe be aware of with a smaller company, but if you buy it through Amazon, you have some level of protection for a return anyway. So uh, I guess it comes down to what it always does, which is at $30, you are paying a lot less. You might introduce some more hassle for yourself if there's a problem. It might take a little bit more effort to get it resolved. Uh, for example, returning to Amazon versus emailing a manufacturer asking for a quick replacement. But uh, it's $30. And so it comes in a lot cheaper than NHU-12S. We don't begrudge you if you would want to buy this cooler instead and save 20 bucks uh, for a budget PC build. That $20 will go a lot better towards something like maybe a CPU or a GPU upgrade or even a case upgrade, where $20 at the low end is the difference between something that's going to get more cool air into this anyway than, uh, say, the NHU-12S upgrade would offer as an alternative. The Scythe Fuma 2 would be our recommended upgrade anyway at $50 if you wanted to get something with higher performance and better noise to thermal profile. Uh, one thing is for certain, though, as long as liquid coolers are mounted such that they contact the CPU IHS, the Vetra will not outperform them. It's pretty good. At $30, it's competitive, but it's not magic. The Fractal Celsius has a challenge with mounting where a poor mount is way easier to do than it should be. It shouldn't be that easy to poorly mount the Celsius. And that's really more of a fault of the mounting mechanism. But the result of that would be that your thermals look worse than the Vetru. The Vetru V5 overall seems to be following our latest trend and reviews on the channel. Lately, we've had a, a couple good weeks here for products that don't suck because the Vetru, it's, it's towards the we don't hate it camp of reviews. And actually, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and graduate that one step up from we don't hate it to it's fine. Meaning, if you want this because it's $30 and it performs reasonably well, then it's fine. We don't think it's a phenomenal cooler. We don't think it's an engineering marvel. It's very hard to engineer something unique in the cooler world anyway. Uh, if you have a stricter budget, then this makes sense to us. We would recommend this over paying an extra $20 for a FUMA 2 or an NHE-12S, even though those are, well, the FUMA 2 especially is a, a much better cooler than AG12. That is more of a reputation thing than a thermal advantage. But we'd still recommend this if you're on a strict budget because the $20 is more important somewhere else, maybe even just in your pocket. That's fine, too. You don't have to spend all the money anyway. So uh, just don't put it under a 200-watt load. You'll be OK. It seems to be fine in roughly the R7, uh, maybe i7 non-K or non-Tau non window Intel CPUs. Uh, something like an R5 would be no problem, especially if you're a 65-watt to uh, say 100 watt TDP, keeping in mind that that number doesn't necessarily mean power in the same way that Vetri is talking about it. But from our testing, uh, something like an R5, R7, no problem. So uh, R7 stretching it, don't overclock it, but you'll be fine otherwise. That's it for this one. It's fine. We don't mind if you buy it. Uh, we don't hate it. And so it makes sense for a budget class PC. And that's about where it starts and it ends for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. If you have other coolers you'd like to see us review specifically, please post a comment below. We saw a lot of requests for Hyper 212s. We have those in the works. We'll do those sometime soon. They're old, but they'll be fun to revisit. And subscribe for more. As always, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. We'll see you all next time.